Aloha, and thank you for joining us. My name is Jan Boyvin, and I am this year's president of the Hawaii State Bar Foundation. I am honored to welcome you on the foundation's behalf. As some of you may know, the foundation seeks to increase the public's understanding of the law, improve the justice system, facilitate delivery of and access to legal services, promote the highest ideals of the legal profession, and inspire the philanthropic spirit in Hawaii's legal community. With your support, the foundation has been able to award grants to multiple organizations that support these goals. We are proud of our grant recipients and all that they have done for Hawaii's community. Today, we plan to highlight several of our grant recipients and then hear from several community leaders on the power of the legal community and philanthropic spirit during these trying times. First, we have Chief Justice Mark Rechtenwald, who is here to say a few words on behalf of the grant recipient, Courts in the Community. Thank you so much, Jan. Aloha, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for coming together today to celebrate the great work being done by the Hawaii State Bar Foundation. I really wanna thank the members of the board of the foundation, Jan, uh, Vice President Lynn Toyofuku, our, the treasurer, Craig, Craig Wagnold, uh, Carol Kita Okra, uh, the secretary, and all the members of the board, and also extend my appreciation to everyone who worked so hard to make this program possible. Uh, I think you have more RSVPs for this show than for any of these events before, which is just amazing. So thanks to uh, the co-chairs, Ray St. Chu, Diane Ono, uh, Louise Ng, Matt, Matt Winter, Think Tech Hawaii for uh, pro uh, producing a, a wonderful program here and Marissa Machida and Bobby Sanaha for creating the uh, wonderful videos that we'll watch. The foundation has done so much good work throughout our community, including supporting a number of judiciary programs. I wanted to talk today about courts in the community, which has really become one of the signature programs of the judiciary and the Supreme Court in particular. It's a very simple concept. You know, it's difficult for the public in general and students in particular to come to the uh, Supreme Court building in downtown Honolulu to watch an oral argument. So our idea was to bring the court out into the community to make it available to students across the state uh, to have the opportunity to watch an actual Supreme Court oral argument, not a mock argument or, a, or, or, or some kind of a simulation, but an actual argument with a real case. Uh, and a critical part of it is to uh, give the students the opportunity to learn about that case in advance, uh, to do mock trials or mock arguments themselves and to learn from members of the bar who uh, volunteer their time to go out to uh, the campuses to meet with the students and the King, King Kamehameha the fifth Judiciary History Center and the Students for Public Outreach and Civil and Education at the Law School and thank you Dean Nelson for their support put together a, a great curriculum for the students to study we then go to uh, and have oral arguments on campus Sometimes up to 500 students are there from an entire island or area of an island. Uh, at the end of the event, we do a question and answer session with the students. First, the lawyers do, and then the, the justices, they can ask us about uh, our role, how we prepare for cases, uh, and our work on the court. So this is a great opportunity uh, for students to learn about and understand the legal system firsthand uh, to really give themselves an, you know, an opportunity to think about the issues that we face and also hopefully to envision themselves uh, with a role in that system someday. And why that matters so much is because uh, you know, our, our entire credibility and authority and legitimacy as an institution is based on the understanding and the informed understanding of our, of our citizens. And really that begins with our young people to understand that we are a system that has legitimacy, that it has integrity, that does listen to all sides of an argument and then makes a reasoned decision. And there's no better way to do that than watch it in action. So uh, we couldn't do it without the foundation. As I said, sometimes we bring as many as 500 students together. It's a long morning. Uh, they're being, uh, in many instances, they have to come, they're coming from uh, quite far away on, on the side of a big, you know, the west side of the big island, east side of Hawaii Island. Uh, so we have to have buses for the students, and that's the first main expense that the foundation's generous contributions cover. I don't think the schools could do it, frankly, without that contribution. So we wouldn't be doing this without the foundation. And then uh, to have lunches for the students, um, you know, the prospect of having 
uh, 500 uh, hungry uh, high school students uh, riding, you know, for a half an hour, an hour on the bus back to their respective schools is also one that would be a deal stopper uh, in our view. So again, I can't, from the bottom of my heart, thanks to everyone who supports the foundation uh, for making this program possible. It really is a, a sort of a cornerstone of our efforts to ensure that everyone in the state can see, understand, and uh, hopefully develop confidence in the work done by our courts. So mahalo to everyone who supports the foundation and mahalo to the foundation and its board. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chief Justice. And now we have a vignette on the impact of this Courts in the Community program. My name is Mark Rechtenwall. I'm the Chief Justice of the Hawaii Supreme Court. Public service has been something I've always cared deeply about. And what could be a better job than going to work in the morning with the goal of providing justice to your community? Folks look, turn to their courts and they look for them to be fair, to provide justice, to help them be able to resolve the difficult problems in their life and to be part of that process is uh, absolutely amazing. One way that the Hawaii State Bar Foundation has really made a difference is supporting our courts in the community. It's very hard for uh, ordinary members of our community, students particularly, to come and see an oral argument in person. So we had the idea of taking our court out into high schools across the state and give students the opportunity to watch an actual case uh, be argued uh, before the court and actually come to understand that it's a system that has integrity, that is fair. And you know, I could talk about those things until I'm blue in the face, but there's no substitute for seeing it in action. And because of the Hawaii State Bar Foundation's support, we've been able to bring this program to 15 uh, different sites across the state over the last eight years or so. More than 5,000 students have come to these oral arguments, and we've had students from 63 different schools. So it's an incredible educational experience for them. And I think it really humanizes the court, and most importantly, I think it provides a real um, in-person example of how this is a system that has integrity, that it is fair, that we ask tough questions of both sides, and it's something that's worthy of their trust and confidence. So really, it's critical. We simply couldn't do it without the foundation's support. everyone. I have the distinct privilege to introduce you to the new Dean of William S. Richardson School of Law, Camille Nelson. Dean Nelson moved to Hawaii over this last summer. Most recently, she hails from American University Washington College of Law, where she was the Dean. Prior to that, Dean Nelson was the first woman and the first person of color as, to serve as Dean of Suffolk University Law School in Boston. Born in Jamaica, Dean Nelson did her undergraduate work at the University of Toronto and received her law degree from the University of Ottawa Faculty of Law, followed by her LLM from Columbia University. A prolific writer, Dean Nelson's scholarship focuses on the intersection of critical race theory and cultural studies with emphasis on health law, criminal law and procedure, as well as comparative law. Some of you may have heard her speak at our recent Move Us Hawaii panel on alternative facts. And I'm sure you will all agree that Hawaii is so fortunate to have Dean Nelson now a part of our community. She will speak to you today about educating tomorrow's legal leaders. Thank you, Dean Nelson, for not only being here this evening with us, but for being a part of our Hawaii community and for being willing to serve the community at large. Dean Nelson. Thank you so much, Diane, for that incredibly gracious introduction. And I want to also thank you, Diane, for reaching out to me to extend this very kind uh, invitation to participate this evening. I'd also like to thank the Hawaii State Bar Foundation leaders for so graciously and warmly welcoming me here. I really appreciate your kindness. John Maxwell, in his book, The 21st Century Leadership, 21 irrefutable laws of leadership stated that leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. If there is truth to that, it behooves us to consider how influence is earned, 
especially for lawyers as trusted advocates. I will endeavor to synthesize much of what I've read, a lot of it falling within the nomenclature of level five leadership, authentic leadership, servant leadership, leadership versus management, diversity and inclusion leadership as well, all with an emphasis on what has been written about leadership specific to lawyers. As an educator, I want to also conceptually think about how we backward design what we learn from this body of research into the legal educational system. My starting point is that a life in the law requires an ongoing commitment to learning through careful reading, respectful engagement with others, research and probing analysis. As practitioners, I recognize that you are always working to master your areas of practice. In that way, you are forever students of the law as it evolves, shifts, and morphs to meet the present moment, often through your direct contributions. Through your ever-increasing knowledge base, you serve your clients with skill and expertise, which in turn engenders credibility, trust, and that influence I started with. These are all crucial aspects to effective leadership. As I think about backward design of leadership dynamics into the academics and programming of legal education, it is imperative that we instill in our students this reality, both the importance of the acquisition of legal skills and expertise, and that a life in the law recognizes that the law is not static. So our profession requires an ongoing commitment to learning. We strive to impress upon our students that one must be willing to be engaged with an ever evolving law, its history and its nuances simultaneously. Also, we need to set high expectations for our work and professional ethic as an elevating component of future leadership. Of course, in becoming an effective leader in law, one is also required to have or to develop excellent interpersonal skills as at its core, legal practice requires collaboration, communication, and engagement with others. I tell my students that law is definitionally interaction and interactive. One seldom does law alone, and I know it's not a verb, but I hope you understand what I mean. For those of us in legal education, we must continue to think about how to ensure that our students have opportunities to build their professional networks through legal and professional opportunities, both internal and external to the law school. Through these networks and through the myriad experiential and extramural opportunities provided to students, they are given the chance to practice and hone these important interpersonal skills and to leverage their EQ in tandem with their IQ. This combination is important, especially when we add agility to the mix. And I'm sure that like me, you often wake up and you have one calendar that you've prepared for and it goes out the window and you're frequently faced with an entirely new day driven by the crises and demands of the moment. Thus, as a leader, you are required to be flexible and to pivot quickly. As such, you must often be a crisis manager, a change agent, and a visionary leader. Especially with what I loosely refer to as pandemic leadership, success requires both near-term vision, excellently serving one's clients and, and enhancing your work in each file and matter, but also a longer-term view. As Hackett states in his book on lawyers as leaders, quote, Leaders in law firms need to be leaders of both the C-suite, that is expert at daily operations of the practice, but also focus on long-term vision. How one effectively teaches agility remains to be determined, but I think that an essential part of this is instilling in our students an understanding that there is seldom certainty in any given day for a leader, let alone lawyers as leaders precisely because we are on call in service of others as servant leaders. So we have to educate about the substance, but also the character and temperament of legal leaders and professionals and manage those expectations around certainty. Within this milieu is an increasing nugget and an interesting one. 
much of the literature indicates that to be an exceptional leader, it is beneficial if one is humble. In the literature, this is referred to the paradox of duality. This is not to infer a lack of ambition, but the ambition is for the organization, firm, or enterprise to excel rather than just for the individual. These types of leaders are secure and self-actualized or self-actualizing and generous. They are self-aware and they are authentic. So where do we start to hone those skills through law school? As many of us recall, first year of law school in particular is deeply humbling, if not destabilizing. We may think we knew or know only to be convinced otherwise through excellent opposing arguments and brilliantly conceptualized legal reasoning and opinions. This is also consistent with my theory that no one does law alone. And I like to hearken to the Beatles and say, we all get by with a little help from our friends. So friends, ultimately backward designing all of these dynamics of leadership into the law school curricula and programming requires an emphasis on professionalism and increasingly on well-being as we work to help students appreciate that they are being onboarded into a profession, one for which there are heightened expectations. I think we do well in the educational space to recommit to the broad possibilities of being a professional school, an elevated space of discourse and of practice preparedness to support our students towards leadership in this noble prof profession in service of others. I think such preparedness is capacious enough to include myriad competencies and inclusive excellence and is consistent with an increasingly diverse and global world, one with a rapidly innovating bar and bench. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to being in conversation with you humbly and to learning your perspectives and insights about leadership in the law and the innovations within the bar and the bench. This reciprocal feedback loop can only help us in educating and preparing the next generation of legal leaders. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Nelson. And now we have two vignettes of additional grantees, the Legal Clinic and the National Judicial College. The mission of the Legal Clinic is really close to my heart. I understand the struggles. I, I'm sensitive to the extra burdens that immigrants bear. Immigration is not an issue that people think of as being a big issue in Hawaii, but it really is. That's the challenge, is how do we figure out how to help this massive population, you know, a total of 100,000 or more people in the state who fall into this category of not yet being citizens. And the legal clinic's um, free legal services is really an exciting way for us to get involved. You know, our services uh, vary from direct one-on-one -on -one legal services to immigrants, uh, to a broader level of trying to improve access for the entire LEP community to unemployment insurance. And then to a lesser degree on a national level by joining with national groups. Uh, in advocating for uh, improvements in our immigration policy. So the Hawaii State Bar Foundation has been one of the early supporters of the legal clinic. Since June of last year, when that grant was made, we've served 102 clients with direct legal services with, through our attorney. And then on top of that, another about 170 that we've served through what we call naturalization workshops. There was a young man who was kept in detention for over a year who, without a lawyer, was teaching himself to fight for his own rights. He had several young kids on the Big Island and a wife, and he'd been there for 30 years and was a beloved community member. But because he had some minor criminal offenses, they, the federal government was ready to deport him back to a country where he really had no resources and connections. So luckily his sister contacted us, figured out that we might be able to help. And it could be precedent setting for Hawaii if we win this case. It'll help other people who deserve to stay here. You know, and our state has the sixth most immigrants per capita. So for us to just have 
a handful of immigration lawyers and very few free services to serve all these folks, it's, there's a huge gap. And so we really want to thank the Bar Foundation in helping us try to meet the unmet need. I'm Leslie Hayashi. I'm a retired judge in the state of Hawaii, and I'm now on the Board of Trustees of the National Judicial College. We are the only educational institution that trains judges. I mean, not only the substantive things like evidence and so on, but the skills that you need to be a good judge. The reason why we got this grant, and we're so grateful for the grant that we got from the Hawaii State Bar Foundation, was to put on a program that dealt with the Japanese incarceration during World War II in Hawaii. Because it is a moment that justice failed. In addition to the program for the judges, we did a town hall meeting for the public and do a reenactment of the Fred Korematsu story, which is a gentleman who refused to go to the incarceration camps. And then he was convicted, and then he was vilified. And eventually, he was able to write this whole thing. And the judge said, yes, all of what happened to you was wrong. And at this time, the courtroom, her courtroom, was filled with so many other people who had been interned and incarcerated. There was just weeping through the courtroom to know that, yes, what had happened was wrong. Justice had failed them, but now people were recognizing it and trying to make amends. I know we got a lot of comments after we had done the Move Me Hawaii program that people said, you know, my father never spoke about this. And when he finally did, tears were rolling down his eyes and we were just, thrilled to be able to start a conversation. Given even all the racial injustice that's happening across the country and the world, this is how the healing starts, by having these kinds of conversations, by judges being out there in the community, by judges learning about the history of this kind of thing. So it's just incredibly invaluable to have this this grant as a, as a way to provide a program that provides a resource for so many people and impacts the lives of so many people. And now we will hear from Greg Fry, president of the Hawaii State Bar Foundation. Thank you, Jan. What an honor to be here. As I watch, listen, and learn from today's program, from today's celebration of the philanthropic spirit of the Hawaii State Bar Foundation, I think really how fortunate I am. As the current 2020 Hawaii State Bar Association president, I have been privileged to listen and learn to be an ex officio member of the foundation board, to watch the officers, Jan, Lynn, Carol, and Craig, together with the most devoted directors I think I've ever had the privilege to be part of. The passion, the energy, the direction to do what they say they are. We are lawyers with aloha. That is the foundation motto. Their purpose is to bring charitable missions to our association and to inspire the philanthropic spirit of our legal community. They do that with so many people here being part of today's celebration, today's tribute to the hard work and the benefactors through the donor program, the fellows. These folks, lawyers, their DNA is quite frankly mirrored by the DNA of our chief justice, who says to all of us, members of the association, 
devoted followers and supporters of the foundation that we are to deliver access to justice to those who most need it. I am proud to be a small part of this and to walk hand in hand, perhaps as a bookend with the foundation and its leaders, because these folks really are the true spirit of the Hawaii State Bar Association and Foundation. Aloha and thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Greg. It's been a joy to work with you. Uh, and now we'll be hearing from Louise Ng uh, to help us introduce us to the next speaker. Hi, aloha. I am so pleased to introduce our next speaker, Micah Kane, Chief Executive Officer and President of the Hawaii Community Foundation and a trustee of Kamehameha Schools. HCF's mission is to help people make a difference by inspiring the spirit of giving and by investing in people and solutions to benefit every island community. Micah has been a visionary at HCF in positioning the foundation as a convener and driver of transformative change in our community. One example is the change framework developed by, by HCF. It is a carefully selected set of statewide data under six key categories aimed at identifying the gaps where help in our community is needed and opportunities where help will do the most good. The idea is that by working from a common set of data, our community can collaborate between business, nonprofits, government, and community members in creating shared goals and consistently tracking progress. To help put HSBFs, our foundation's role, in the broader community context, here is Micah Kane. Thank you, Louise, and aloha and mahalo for the opportunity to be with you today. You know, before I take my three to four minutes, I wanna thank you for the work you do in our community, especially raising awareness about some of the systemic inequities that Hawaii is attempting to deal with. I also wanna thank you for raising awareness about the role philanthropy can play in this work. And hopefully as a collective, we can move from addressing symptoms of a problem to moving up the pipeline to changing the systems that are creating them. So again, thank you for making this part of your agenda this afternoon. I hope with the little time I have with you, I can just whet your appetite on a few thoughts that I think are, are important. You know, it's hard right now in a time of crisis to step back and really evaluate the landscape that we're, we're operating in. Um, you know, the Tuesday elections captured the attention of, of many of us and probably still is right now. There were interesting races across the federal, state and county governments. And not to mention this was all done in a all mail-in election and first time for many of us. But regardless of who you, who you voted for, we have new faces in office and the political campaign pledges are over. But what is right in front of us is the sobering reality of all that needs to be dealt with at every level of government and in our markets and in our communities. And not to mention, we're still dealing with the issues of COVID. As challenging of a time as this is, there will be opportunity to rethink the role of Hawaii's government, rethink Hawaii's economic business model, and rethink Hawaii's communities of our future. And as it is in most cases, the real question is gonna be, you know, how do we get alignment? How do we create alignment by those influences and forces out there? And I wanna just leave you and highlight with three opportunities that I think give us the greatest opportunity uh, for success. The first is for us to focus on the 80% we agree on and just parking lot the 20% we don't. There's way too many uh, low hanging fruits out there for us to get stuck on the 20%. Let's focus on the 80 because that's where our consensus is and let's get to know each other, let's build trust and then we can challenge ourselves on the 20 later. The second is to be very intentional about our actions. And, and what that means to me is that it's, you know, playing in the gray area is not being intentional and it's the oldest trick in the book. You know, being intentional means being transparent, which really means accepting a higher degree of vulnerability for all of us. And it means 
they, we all have to get a bit more comfortable being uncomfortable. And then lastly, and it may sound a little boring, and Louise kind of touched on it a bit, really want to push us to, to lean on data. And, and the reason for that is it takes the emotion out of the conversation. At least it does for, for a lot of issues. And this is not going to be unfamiliar to you. Lawyers rely on facts, and, and that's what you do. Um, I'm married to one, so I, I know that for a fact. And at the end of the day, um, that's really what's going to bring us home. Keep that emotion out of the equation. You know, we've been very fortunate at HCF to deal with some really, really good partners. Louise is one of them that we hold near and dear to our heart in the work we do with her. But there's many others that are part of your organization that we're just very grateful to work with. And would it be where we're at today without the longstanding years of support that many of our attorney partners um, have worked with us, have introduced us to some critical legacy partners who have really established um, dreams for others. And so I really want to thank you for all that you do for Hawaii, that all that you do for the Hawaii Community Foundation. And we really look forward to growing this partnership with the Hawaii State Bar Foundation. Thank you so, so much, Micah. Now we're going to hear from Lynn Toyofuku, uh, past president of the Hawaii State Bar Foundation. And she's going to share a little bit more about the genesis of some of our fundraising programs and a very special board member who was at the heart of it. Ray's contributions to Access for Justice, as well as her leadership within the legal um, community span over 40 years, starting as a young attorney at Legal Aid, then as a public defender, and as an advocate for individuals with disabilities. In the mid 70s, she dedicated her effort to protecting the rights of women and families as the founder of Hawaii Women Lawyers. She also was a founding member of the Hawaii Women's Legal Foundation and its president in 1991, where she tirelessly chaired fundraising events dedicated to raising money to support organizations that protected women and children and, and um, advocated for gender fairness. She also served as a board member on the Access for Justice Commission and the Hawaii Lawyers for Justice. Also active as a community leader, Ray served on the board of Planned Parenthood, um, raising funds to ensure women's reproductive rights are protected, and on the board of the Girl Scouts Council of Hawaii, dedicated to the empowerment of every girl. In 2009, she served as the president of the Hawaii State Bar Association, only the third female attorney to do so. 2012 saw the creation of the Hawaii State Bar Foundation to serve as the fundraising arm of the bar purposed to augment funds available for legal services and community educational projects. Ray has been a board member since its inception and created the Hawaii Bar, Hawaii State Bar Fo Foundation's Fellows Program, styled after the American Bar Foundation's Fellows Program. Through her enthusiastic efforts, and as well as generous efforts, the fellows program has prospered and has raised several hundred thousand dollars to support grants to providers of legal services, including legal aid, VLSH, the legal clinic, lawyers for equal justice and restorative justice, as well as to mediation service providers on the neighbor islands and courts in the community and, access, and the Access for Justice Commission. I am so honored to introduce Ray St. Chu, a visionary contributor to the Hawaii State Bar Foundation. And with Ray is her husband, Rich Turbin, an outstanding personal injury attorney, former president of the Bar Association, and a dedicated community leader. Thank you, Lynn. My family and I left China when I was a young child. Although my parents were college professors, I never forgot that I was an immigrant along with the huddled masses yearning to breathe free and fortunate to live in a democratic society. So uh, I grew up in a working class family uh, in Queens, uh, New York City. Uh, it was kind of rough and tumble. 
As an adolescent, I found myself uh, defending victims from bullies. Eventually, I got tired of the physical fighting, and I said, I'll try to defend, defend with my voice. I decided to be a lawyer, and I learned that protecting others is the best way to protect yourself. We both started our legal careers as public defenders where we met. Having the same values and passion in pursuing justice, we have stuck together for well over 40 years. We are the fortunate parents of Laurel May Singh, an assistant professor at the University of Hawaii, and Derek Turbin, a Hawaii and California licensed attorney practicing now in Hawaii. We have an abiding faith and dedication to our legal system, as both of us served as HBA, HSBA presidents. Rich, in 2004, and I served as HSBA president in 2009, right after the 2008 financial crisis, where so many legal service organizations had many, many challenges to stay afloat much like the current situation and uh, with the global pandemic. During those years, I realized that Hawaii Bar members must step up as a group and as individuals to fulfill the needs of our community. Rich and I have grown up professionally in this community and we want to give back to this community that we love and has given us so much. Our children are independent and will not need our support. We want to make an impact now and see the fruits of our contributions to the causes we support to take care of our community. There is no, uh, there is no better cause than to support the pursuit of justice and promote our legal profession. We need to stand together to assist those in our community that would not have access to the justice system, but for the good work of the bar and organizations this foundation supports. Every bit helps in providing for the legal needs of the Hawaii people. Please consider us in joining us in making a donation of any size that you feel comfortable to the Hawaii State Bar Foundation. Thank you all very much for participating in our virtual reception. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Rich. The foundation is so grateful and you're just examples of the philanthropic spirit, you really are. On behalf of the foundation, I do wanna pause and present Ray, Ray sent you with a founding fellows award. This is the first, first ever award of its kind at, at the foundation. I want to impress that upon you. Uh, Ray, thank you. Thank you for your generosity, your leadership, and your tenaciousness in helping the foundation raise much needed funds to support all of these wonderful programs we're hearing about today. And thank you, Ray and Rich, for your 2020 gift of $10,000 to the foundation. I really have to mention that now. Your gift presents really a gentle challenge to all of our attendees here to come together with Aloha to support Hawaii during these trying times. You know, it was Greg who reminded us that our motto here today is lawyers with aloha. And that is what we are and that is who you both are. So thank you. Please know that your legacy will remain with the foundation and Hawaii's community for years, years to come. And then closing our presentation to all of you who have joined us today, I want to thank you for taking time out of your schedules to hear about our foundation's activities and to learn about our grant recipients and to hear inspiring words from all of our community leaders. We're so grateful that we had this opportunity to come together. And I do want to say special thanks to all of our wonderful speakers for being here. It's not easy to hold these virtual conferences and everyone you heard today spoke from the heart. And I think you did hear the passion that came across and the gratefulness we, we have for members of the bar and all of your contributions. So I do want to also thank Think Tech Hawaii and they were so gracious to assist us with this event and many hands, as you know, it takes a village sometimes to host these wonderful events. So on behalf of the foundation, mahalo nui loa, have a wonderful evening and thank you for joining us.